We have discussed a, a wide range of physical phenomena that govern material behavior uh, regarding its reversible elastic type behavior as well as irreversible behavior involving plasticity, cracks, fatigue, etc. Um, so at some point when we were discussing the stress strain curve, I told you that one typical behavior that materials display is actually uh, rate sensitivity. In other words, how fast you deform, deform it um, determines its stress strain response. And also the temperature at which you do this determines this response as well. Um, so we want to discuss also a little bit this type of behavior um, and in a setting where this behavior is essentially um, idealized into a mathematical uh, description and that setting is called viscoelasticity. Yeah, notice that there is the keyword elasticity appearing here together with the word viscous implicitly um, at the front. Uh, which suggests that somehow viscosity together with elasticity is going to uh, play a role. Uh, I'm going to discuss this topic uh, in a setting uh, that is primarily oriented or um, in a way that where I have in my mind uh, polymers. Um, now, polymers, it's something that was incorporated in all of our discussions, elasticity, thermoelasticity, plasticity, etc. So, polymers were all over the place. Some of the discussions were, uh, in some sense, or to some extent, were primarily geared towards uh, metals, but in many places we uh, made sure that we addressed both metals and polymers in particular, as well as other types of materials um, in our discussions. They were incorporated because all of these materials eventually employ in engineering, but polymers in particular have a very, very um, um, special place uh, because they are, um, for a long time now, they've, they've come into uh, engineering um, analysis or design after metals, I would say, but they are now very widely used in cars, aircraft, etc. So it's also important that we um, carry out a discussion that is somehow specialized towards polymers. And uh, so I'll just make a note here, but just keep in mind that many of the things that I will say will, in one way or another, apply to, of course, metals as well. And in fact, uh, I'm going to carry out the discussion in a way that's slightly different than the one you will find in the book. In the book, you'll see the keyword creep appearing more often. Uh, it's not necessarily um, um, going to fit in the formulation of our viscoelasticity discussion, but eventually uh, these two concepts are very close to related to each other. In fact, the uh, keyword creep will uh, come up um, in our discussions as well. So, well, let's go ahead and let me first try to summarize what it is that we are trying to do here. So, I'll do this because it does not follow the book's discussion. Um, in a way that follows very well structured steps. So the first is uh, the first step is the basic idea. Okay. Um, now the first basic idea is that first of all we understand how an elastic solid works. I'm going to focus to one D. Remember we often pick a path through our survey of the mechanics of engineering materials. And as we're doing that, we pick certain levels of complexity. We looked at elasticity, we looked at also anisotropic elasticity, but then when we looked at thermal effects, we just went back to isotropy, but still in 3D. In this case, I'm gonna stick to 1D. Uh, many other things we do can easily be generalized to 3D, but I'm gonna stick to 1D to emphasize uh, many of the complexities that occur in the context of this elasticity. So when I say um, the material model for an elastic solid now, and we just start with that, so the keyword here is a elastic solid, um, and that model is sigma equals E epsilon, okay, just 1D uh, as in 231. And now what we he see here is that if you want to calculate the stress in an elastic solid, um, the way we do that is we calculate the amount of deformation 
we don't care how fast you reach that deformation you can pull on a specimen or a structure um, and induce a strain of say 10% in a matter of milliseconds or an hour we don't care this material model does not take into account how fast you impose a certain strain it's just the magnitude that matters Now, on the other hand, let's recall the material model for a Newtonian fluid. So, when I say Newtonian, I'm going to throw in the word viscous. When I say Newtonian, I do understand that it is actually viscous but I want to specialize that viscous behavior and um, what so the keyword here is elastic solid versus viscous fluid and what is primarily interesting in that case is that the material displays strong rate sensitivity so a Newtonian fluid is rate sensitive well, how? Let's let's draw a simple example. I will take a coordinate system, um, x and y. When we displace a certain point along the x-direction, we displace it by an amount u. If we displace it in the v in the y direction, I'm just going to call that um, that v. So we will take two plates. And we're going to imagine that the plate at the bottom is fixed. And I'm going to fix it by saying that, of course, it doesn't move eventually in the vertical direction. But we're going to say that the rate at which the displacement changes along the horizontal direction, so u dot dot indicates a time derivative, uh, it is equal to zero. So the velocity is equal to zero of the plate along the um X direction and also along the Y direction, but the top plate is actually moved with a non-zero velocity. So here is where we have the fluid, if you like, in between. And now we shear it. And what we know from our basic fluid mechanics is that this is a flow where we will have a linear velocity profile in other words, the fluid points, particles at the bottom, near the bottom plate or on the bottom plate, they don't move anywhere because they stick to the plate. And above, they also stick to the plate and hence they move with the plate. So there is a velocity gradient. And here, I idealize that as being, um, as being a um, linear distribution. So what I will do is I will take a certain region in that profile and that distance I'm going to call delta y. So that's a certain distance delta y. And I'm going to go ahead and try to calculate the stresses that develop in the fluid. Now the stresses we remember uh, are of type shear stress, so that's a tau. And the fluid is sensitive to the amount of or the rate of change of the velocity with respect to position. So in other words, to the slope of that line. The slope of that line is the change in the velocity as I move from that point to that point. So here it's zero, here it's a non-zero value. And so from that point to that point, it's gonna change by a certain amount. I call that delta u dot, change in the velocity. And I move through a distance delta y, okay? And so the stress, it turns out, is proportional to that value. The constant of proportion, proportionality is called the viscosity. And the units of viscosity is Pascal seconds. All right. Um, so to make this form fit to a form that we like um, in the context of this course, I will write it as such. So I'm going to write it as eta. And then this is going to be delta u over delta y. And then I will go ahead and take the time derivative and I'll put a bar on top of everything to indicate that the dot applies to all of this now. 
I'll take a time derivative of that. So when I take a time derivative, delta y is just a distance. It doesn't depend on y, but the amount of displacement of these points will depend on time. The more I wait, the more to the right any part fluid particle will move due to this velocity that I impose. So when I take the derivative, it's going to go on to delta u. It's going to be delta u dot, and then I'm going to get the same expression. Okay. So this quantity over here now, you will recognize as something that has to do with the amount by which I start with a vertical line and then with displacement of that line, that line starts to have a different angle and as time progresses that angle will become more and more and more, the angle with respect to the vertical direction. And the reason is that the top points are moving, the bottom points are not. So originally, if the fluid particles are aligned along this line, with time, they, the top ones stick to the plate, the bottoms don't move anywhere, so the fluid particles throughout this distance follow such a profile in terms of uh, displacement. And so this thing measures the amount of delta u, the amount of displacement in the horizontal versus the vertical direction, that's the vertical distance. So it's a measure, if you like, you see, it's a measure of this angle. It's like the tangent, right, of that angle. And if the displacements are small enough, then that tangent is approximately equal to the line, the, the angle itself. And that angle is nothing but the shear strain, gamma, that we defined earlier. Okay. So ultimately what I see that the amount of um, stress in a fluid can be represented as tau multiplying the time rate of change, the time derivative of the shear strain. So this is the shear strain and this quantity here, it's the rate of shear strain, it's called the strain rate. Okay, so therefore now I can go back and compare the idealized behaviors of a, I will say a pure, so this idealized or pure is going to mean the same thing for me, idealized or pure elastic solid, which behaves like that, and I'll compare that with the idealized or pure viscous fluid behavior, which is like this. In one, the stress is sensitive to the amount of strain, but not to its the rate at which it is realized. In the other one, the amount of strain doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter whether I shear by 1%, 2%, or 3%. What only matters is how fast I do it, right? So gamma itself doesn't appear in this relation. It's the rate of change of gamma that matters, okay? So uh, whereas a pure solid behavior is, pure elastic solid behavior is as such, a, I will say a pure or idealized, for our purposes at least, um, fluid behavior, is one where magnitude of gamma is irrelevant, um, but the rate of gamma is important. Okay. Um, so this type of rate sensitivity, so this is what we call a material that is rate sensitive. It is amount, it's, it is sensitive to the rate at which you deform it. Okay, so that is the definition of rate sensitivity. So, um, a rate sensitivity turns out is at the heart of viscoelasticity as well. So, and you already have an indication of what, the, what that would um, possibly mean. Uh, what that's going to mean is a type of behavior in which you see some elasticity, in other words, some sensitivity to the amount of strain, but not to the rate, ideally. But now there's going to be some viscous effect as well. So there's going to be an additional also sensitivity to the rate. And therefore, we're going to have an overall behavior in which not only the amount of deformation matters, but also its rate importance. So a viscoelastic material is eventually um, going to mean a type of material where you have simultaneous elastic solid and viscous fluid effects appearing.
right? And that's our first step. So that's the basic idea. That's what we expect from the concept of viscoelasticity. But we have to build that concept carefully. And so let's take the next step so that we can motivate uh, the uh, construction of appropriate viscoelastic material models.